All right, folks, welcome into another great episode of I've Got a Theory. I'm your host, Hennish Pullicle. I'm joined by my new friend, Sam Knowles, calling in from the UK. Hello. Welcome on, Sam. Um, I'm really excited to have you on. I think you might be my first. No, that's not true. You're my first overseas guest because I've had guests from Canada before. So I can't okay. say internationals, but overseas. And we're Very well, I'm, 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 I'm waving kind of 6,000 miles to you from the south coast of England. Yeah, awesome. Well, uh, thank you for joining us. Before we get started, I want to take a minute to thank Manscaped, our sponsor for the show, for hooking up this gear and then also taking care of men's grooming. Um, what's going on in, in the UK in the world of men's grooming? Is this a topic that anyone ever discusses or is it something that's kind of still behind bedroom doors only? Uh, well, do you know what I was? I was. I was just thinking thinking about this when you were talking about it. Um, I I'm in my early fifties. I play in an old man's cricket team uh, in the UK, and I can't tell you that there's been much conversation over the cricket tees about men's grooming. Um, I think it depends who you who who you are and who you know. Um, I think it's more of a kind of metrosexual conversation, but. Uh, I think we're probably lagging a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's not something that usually people talk about. Maybe you make a joke about it if you're single and you're dating and you're considering those kind of aspects of your life. Um, but, but, you know, for older married guys, you know, you, you do what you do. And if your wife isn't too repulsed by it, you just kind of stick with it. <laughs> no, I mean, listen, don't get me wrong. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm all for it. And I think a little bit of care can, make, can, can, bring, uh, can bring fresh spark to old relationships. That's true. Well, uh, thanks to Manscaped. Please use the code I've got a theory on their website to uh, get discounts and free delivery on your men's grooming products and, and lotions and creams and spritzers and things like that. They've got all kinds of crazy stuff. It's nuts. So um, with that out of the way, Sam, let's talk about your theory. You're, you're an author. You're a, a data scientist. You, you do a lot of different things. Maybe give me you know, like a, a quick 10 second resume, uh, ver, you know, elevator resume of what, what you are you know, and what you've done. Sure. Uh, I call myself a data storyteller. Uh, I help uh, largely companies, although I've worked with you know government departments and charities and so on, but largely companies to use data smarter. And, and I help them to use data smarter in two, in two principal ways. One is to communicate better. So I call myself a data storyteller. How do you use data in a human and empathetic way to get people to understand what you do? And then to innovate faster, so to get to insight better. Uh, I think insight is a is a is a is a real superpower, a real superpower that can help unlock uh, and drive innovation. But I don't think that we're terribly good at thinking about thinking as a species. We're not very good at getting metacognitive and understanding what goes on in this most powerful supercomputer that we have between our ears. Wow, that's uh, you know it's huge and it's relevant and it's so necessary because uh, unfortunately a lot of people make decisions based on their gut. And I've had an old mentor teach me a long time ago, go that gut stands for gave up thinking, right? <laughs> and, so, and so instead, it'd be, be wiser to use data and information that you could, that you could look into to, to make decisions not with your gut. Well, I, I think that I think that's so interesting. The, the, um, the, there's a Princeton psychologist uh, in his late 80s now, Daniel Kahneman, wrote the book Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, and he, he's, he's got, he's, he, I want to say two things about him. One is that uh, he's got this lovely um, quote that thinking is to humans as swimming is to cats. They can do it, but they prefer not to. I think that's a great starting point. That is point. a good quote. Yeah, you're right. If, yeah, um, if, if given the option, you'd rather not. <laughs> but but they, I mean he, I mean his opposite number Steve Pinker at Harvard wrote this big fat book about 25 years ago called How the Mind Works which con which concludes that we actually lack the cognitive architecture the brain power to understand how the mind works which you know is is slightly depressing um, the other thing about Kahneman though Kahneman in in his work over 40 50 60 years has pretty much I mean pretty much I think demonstrated that the way we make decisions is uh, emotionally. We, 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 we make decisions using the ancient limbic reptilian brain that we share with birds and with mammals and with reptiles. Um, and then we, as, as, human creature, as human beings, we make decisions in the same way that every other creature does. The way that the, the, the advantage, if you like, or the, um, the, the, the difference about human decision making is that we go on to justify, justify them rationally using the cerebral cortex, which is the bit of the brain that we have and no other creatures do, that makes us 
distinctly human. So, I mean, I think that we do make a lot of decisions about how we vote, about how, what we buy, about what, what brand of whatever it may be that we buy emotionally, and then go on to justify them rationally. It, it's, it, so, so I think in communications, when we're using data to help people communicate smarter, in communications, I think it's really important to get that balance. You know, David Ogilvy, you know, that original madman on, on Madison Avenue in the late 40s, uh, you know, David Ogilvy was talking about balancing the rational and, and the emotional back in the in the 40s. And I think it's very true about all sorts of communication. When we're trying to persuade people, we need to appeal to their gut, but we also need to help them justify their decisions rational. 100%. And so, you know, with that being said and out of the way, <clears throat> would you have a theory that we could discuss today? A uh, theory. So my theory is that um, actually, if we do, uh, like cats occasionally go swimming and, and start to think about thinking, my theory is that one of the most important uh, aspects to problem solving, uh, and I want to distinguish insightful problem solving from analytical problem solving, I think, I think an, insight, an insight problem is different from analysis. Uh, insight is, you know, for me, an insight is a profound and useful understanding of a person or a topic or an issue that allows you to do something differently. And analytical, uh, and that is not solved uh, by working and working and working away at it. Um, and it uh, an analytical problem, you know, let's think about, you know, be it nuclear physics or Sudoku or whatever it might be. If it's, if it's, if it's solvable, it can be solved with the application of enough work. An insight problem, when we're trying to get a profound and useful human and empathetic understanding of, uh, of a person or a thing or an issue requires this magic ingredient. And my theory is that this magic ingredient is time out. We need to consciously divert ourselves from thinking about the insight problem we're trying to crack, uh, divert ourselves in all sorts of ways in order to allow our sub subconscious mind to do its brilliant recombinatorial thing of taking something old and something old and making something amazingly new. 100%. That's awesome. And so basically, you've got a problem, you get some information, you don't know how to solve it, you need to take a break, give your mind a little break, let it digest what you've taken in, and see if somehow your brain puts together a solution. You're, so, so, I mean, I, I do agree with, you know, I, 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 after originally uh, studying uh, Latin and Greek and Sanskrit and classics, um, because I was, you know, badly taught math at school. Um, after about a dozen years in consultancy, I went back to school and became a, a psychologist. For I did a master's and a doctorate in psychology in my in my in my mid thirties. Um, and one of the things that I, I came across time and time again in that in that new um, that new period of study, that revived period of study, was that. Um, we understand so little about the conscious and the subconscious mind. There are people, you know, there's a, there's a book uh, called The Mind is Flat by a guy called Nick Chater, and, uh, and he maintains there's no such thing as a subconscious mind. He says, there is no subconscious. Everything appears on the surface. Everything is in the conscious. I have to say, and it would be another podcast or two, I have to say, I just cannot believe and agree with that. Not, but not because I'm a great kind of Freudian um, psycho, kind of psychoanalytical believer, but rather because if you think of when you do solve those problems, you think, well, where did that come from? How did? Uh, well, I wasn't thinking about that. No, yeah. The, no, and the, that's the, why that's why the term sleep on it comes on comes right. Because yeah, right? sometimes you might dream of a solution to a problem that you've been thinking about the day before. So uh, you so you showed me you should you you were holding up some so, so some of the sponsors products that you use in the shower. Here's some products uh, that I use in the shower. They are kids um, washable crayons. And the reason that I have kids washable crayons is because so often when you're having a bath, having a shower, an idea will come. You know, it's not quite like a beautiful mind when we, the, the equations are written out, but. I will very often write stuff in the shower. Um, it sometimes drives my wife to distraction, the number of pads and recording devices and, uh, and ideas journals that there are lying around the house. But because you never know when, when these things are gonna strike, I think it's very, very important to be able to capture them because you know how fleeting they are. You know, you sleep on it, you wake up, you know, you can wake up in the middle of the night, you've got the idea, you scribble it down on the pad and you wake up in the morning because you haven't turned the light on to wake up your partner and you can't quite read your writing. I think it's really important to try and capture, to capture those things when they come to you, because otherwise they will, you know, I've often, had, I've often had thoughts, you know, I go out for a run or if you're out for a swim or whatever it might be, you're kind of having a thought and you think you turn it over in your mind. I think I've worked it out. I think I've worked it out. And by the time you tell yourself dry or get home, it's gone. 
So it's important. Yeah, and, and, I, and, and I, I agree with you that, that I would disagree that there is no subconscious. I think there is. And, and maybe it's not subconscious as much as drowning out or quieting out the noises that take up the active use of your brain, right? All your stresses, where am I going to get my next meal? Do I have money in the bank this month? Whose problems am I trying to solve today? What are my own problems? And those kind of things take up a lot of your active use of your brain. And if you can't quiet that down, it's hard to solve problems and tap into your subconscious, right? So take some practice, right? I would say that's what people meditate for yeah. or do, you know, deep dives or exploratory breathing exercises even, right? And, you know, I would say that a majority of the purpose of a breathing exercise is to quiet your mind. Absolutely. Right? No, and so, 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 so uh, Sam, what are some of the ways that people can get to that level of insight from, from quieting their mind? So I think I'll give you, I'll give you a few. Um, there's a, an American, I think he lives, I think, I think he lives in Connecticut, a business book writer called Dan Pink. He's written a book called To Sell His Humans, written another book called Drive about human motivation and behavior. And his most recent book is a book called When. Um, and he looks at, he's like a, I describe him as being like a kind of low, low, low rent Malcolm Gladwell. That's kind of rude to both of them, really. He's, he's got, he's, he, he's, he's not low rent, but he explains complex social psychology and, and, and not so much neuroscience necessarily, but, but he, he explains things in a very usable way. And I, 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 I hold him as a, as a, as a kind of shining light, you know, in the, in the books that I write, I hold his style and the way that he will bring um, science forward and make it practical. Um, I hold him def definitely as being a bit of a shining light. So in this book, When, he talks about the times of day that it's ideal to do a whole variety of different things. And one of, one of my favourite exercises he recommends, and I've done this uh, quite often, and it really works, he calls the nappuccino, right? The nappuccino is this, you know, we, you know, we have in our biorhythm, we have a, we have a, a kind of a, a drowsiness after lunch. Now, that's not just because if you have a, you know, a big sandwich or a big bowl of pasta that you, you know, you're processing all the carbs. But actually, one of the reasons that you do feel drowsy after lunch is because because biorhythmically we, we're programmed to go into a to a. Uh, either a sleep or a relaxation period in the middle of the day. We, we've done some work to begin with, we refuel and we have a relaxation period. So with a nappuccino, caffeine doesn't get into the bloodstream for about 25 minutes. You, there are lots of psycho, uh, psychosomatic uh, bits of, of drinking coffee if you, if you are a coffee drinker. There's lots of psychosomatic things, you know, you have your first sip, you think you're ready to go for the day. In fact, it's not in the bloodstream for 25 minutes. So what Pink recommends is this. Um, you take a double espresso or however you take your coffee, but you need a couple of shots. Uh, you knock it back uh, after, after lunch uh, and then you put on an eye mask, you put in noise cancelling headphones and you set up, but just before you've done that, you've set your alarm for 25 minutes you do, and then you go to sleep. Now you set it for 25 minutes or you try and go to sleep. You lie down in a quiet room where you, can't, where you, where you have no sensory input whatsoever. You may well find you don't go to sleep because it's a bit of an unusual thing to do, right? You've, you've got the pressures of the morning's meetings um, still building with you, but you try and still your mind and you lie and you, you, you lie for 25 minutes. The alarm goes off after 25 minutes. Now you may well find, as I have found several times, um, that I have gone to sleep. Um, but what, what effectively happens just at the moment that that, that, that bell goes off uh, on, your, on your smartphone or whatever it may be, uh, and you've had 25 minutes, it's, and the caffeine will be kicking in. And as the caffeine kicks in, it's like you have a second morning and it makes you so unbelievably productive and receptive to the ideas that your subconscious has been turning over. Because what the sub subconscious I think is really, really good at doing, and there's decent evidence for this, in including recent neuroscientific evidence. What it's good at doing is saying, well, I know this and I know this, are these things related? I'm not sure. Um, uh, actually, what if you put this and this together? What if you put a carrot and a, a carrot and a kangaroo together? Does that mean anything? Now. Your conscious. I, I think there's some kind of, let's call it a sphincter or a or or a or a or a, or a, 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 um, a membrane that, that ideas will pass through. So this will say, come on, kangaroo and carrot. You know, there's nothing there's nothing worth thinking about there. But you know, phone and the internet to Steve Jobs after. Oh yeah, we could possibly do something like we. Could, oh yeah, we could definitely do something. Like so I think these things uh, have a tendency to pop through. But this nappuccino. Uh, as a way of washing away what's been there in the morning, if you get that opportunity to sleep, then the chance to have a second morning, I strongly recommend you try.
Do you do this? I do do this. I don't do it every day. Without doubt, I don't do it every day. So I do a variety of different things. I consult, I train, um, uh, I speak, I write. Uh, on days that I'm writing, I do two things. One of them is to do a, to do an afchino, but the other is if you come across the five two or the intermittent fasting. Uh, yeah, I've heard of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've done a little so, bit myself. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I've been doing it for seven, eight, seven or eight years or so, and I I, I love it. I don't do it principally for what are the claimed uh, long term health benefits of it, and you know they they they, they absolutely may well be there. Uh, these long term health benef uh, benefits. Um, I do it rather. Uh, because it means that the blood is not in my stomach between sun up and sundown. Um, it's not digesting food. Mm. What it's doing uh, during those days is being available to my brain. When you eat yeah. uh, during the day, the you know, blood's got to go in different places. Um, I find it much easier to write and to write at length and to do uh, what is known as you know, deep work uh, in those days when I'm not, I'm not having, I'm not having the blood focus there. Um, if you if you combine a nappuccino with uh, with intermittent fasting, it's like dynamite. I think you know I can on a really good day if I know what I'm going to be writing, I can write seven seven and a half thousand day uh, words, which is quite a lot of words. That's um, a lot. They're not they're not necessarily in the right order. They're not necessarily you know brilliant flowing prose, but I can I can I can get a good run on a on a on an intermittent fasting uh, plus. Uh, Nappuccino day, you could get up to 10,000. So, you know, I don't know whether they're better words. I've not done the experiment to find out, but I can be more productive doing that. So that's one very good way of- And there's different that. techniques, right? There's different ways to skin this cat of how to take a break for your mind to, to generate some insightfulness to you. And so, you, so, you know, candidly, I'll share one of my ways is uh, I've gotten into a habit of getting a massage weekly, which huh? sounds decadent, but at the same point, that's literally probably my only time where there's no noise coming into my head. Because if I'm at work, there's people trying to get my attention. If I'm at home, I've got kids and family trying to get my attention. If I'm out and about, there's someone always trying to get my attention. So I find that that one hour when someone's working on my sore muscles, I can literally detach my mind from my body, and regardless of how hard they are working on it or feeling on my knots that, that are painful. If I'm paying attention, I can detach and I can quiet my mind, focus on the light, listen to nothing, focus on my breathing. And then sure enough, you know, about five, 10, 20 minutes into this thing, I start getting like a stream of ideas that, that I try to quiet also to see if I could filter out the garbage and see if I can get some real gems out of it. And at the end of every session, I end up with two to five great takeaways. Oh, and I'll come back the next day and I'll come up with these ideas to share with my company or my family or whatever that, you know, whatever things that we're trying to improve on. And that's where I get my insight. And I tell people that and they kind of laugh. They're like, ah, whatever, you like massages. True. <laughs> but at the same point, that's also where I do my best thinking. I think, I think that is such an excellent, such an excellent example. Um, one of the, so I, I've worked in marketing services agencies before I, I created my own data storytelling business. Um, and one of the, you know, th there are a number of different roles in, let, let's, let's say, say ad, ad agencies or digital marketing agencies, number of roles. There are, uh, and, and let's not think about technical things. There are, there are, there are, there's the creative role. You know what? You know what's what? What's the message going to be? What's the film going to be? What's the digital banner going to be? Um, so there's kind of both verbal and visual creatives. So the creatives, there are the suits who are the you know the account handlers, and then there are the planners. And the planners are the are the ones who are required to you know get inside the mind, the mindset of the of the target audience. They're the ones who who geek out on data, who spend time um, looking for insight and 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 being the real insight engines that allow the creative to be the right thing to make and allow the suits to sell the ads to the clients. So um, I do not know, and I've met, oh, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 uh, creatives, some of them running teams of several hundred creatives, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 70, 80 uh, planners, some of them running teams of several hundred planners for global, you know, P&Gs and Unilevers around the world. Um, I've not met one who doesn't run or swim. Now, uh, and, and do that regularly. Now, what they don't do is run or swim in order to solve the insight challenge that they're facing. They don't do it. They don't go and say, right, I need to understand how to sell Lipton tea in France. They don't, they don't that's not, and I need to understand the French tea. That's not what they consciously do. 
but they go off and they are completely undistractable. So if you're running, it's really hard for, an, I mean, I suppose if, you know, if you've got a smartwatch, you've got, a, you've got an Apple watch, it could go off, but you can, you can, you can mute it, right? And it's sure. less, less likely. If you go swimming, I mean, it's really unlikely that you're gonna have a smart device anywhere near you. No, and um, I've, heard, I've heard the same thing from a friend of mine, <clears throat> one of those guys that swims 200, 400 laps in the morning, and he'll say the same thing. He's like, I can just do it on autopilot and I get to think about stuff. And so they, they, they don't, so, so, so your friends and my planners, they don't, they're not consciously going to take that exercise in order to solve any specific problem. But just like you with your massage, when they come back, when they come back, they get back to the desk. Oh, well, I know I, I've got the answer to that now, or, or it doesn't have to be instantaneous, but, but just allowing your mind not to be constantly distracted by the smallness of our lives. Um, you know, we're constantly like, you know, staring into our phones, uh, the smallest of our lives. Um, I, in, uh, I, you, you, you may, I, I, I interviewed um, a number of different people um, for my book on Insight, uh, I, from a loads of different fields, uh, be they actors, psychiatrists, musicians. I wanted to know about, you know, getting into the mind of the composer. How do you get that kind of insight? Were there parallels in different areas? One of the people I, I interviewed was a, a, an English um, psychiatrist called Baroness Susan Greenfield. She's, she's very eminent. She's at Oxford University. Um, she runs actually now a business that's looking into um, the psychiatry of, Al of Alzheimer's and, and has got some very promising uh, drug therapies in that area. But she introduced me to a really fascinating school of um, Dutch uh, experimental psychology. It's known as environmental psychology. Um, and this school of psychology shows the following thing, which is that if you go, so if you are somewhere big, and by big, I mean the desert or the ocean or the big outdoor countryside. I don't mean kind of little hills, and I definitely don't mean cities, and I definitely don't mean sitting hemmed in a, in a, in a kind of rabbit hutch type office, but get somewhere big. If you get somewhere big, time effectively slows down, slows down. So it effectively slows down for this reason because you have fewer competing stimuli for your attention as you describe yourself you know your colleagues your clients your realtors your your kids in those different environments which you don't have on the massage table and i presume if you're on the massage table you're very often face down your eyes are on the bench or you maybe you wear a mask on your eyes or your eyes are closed if you don't have those competing stimuli when you're somewhere big you know you're lucky to be in california to have you know the the ocean to be able to look out of look out and get, kind of kind of go swimming in. Um, we have a slightly smaller English Channel about five miles away. Um, but if you if you if you go somewhere big, time slows down. Effectively slows down. You can process more stimuli, both incoming stimuli, but also those things that are in your mind that you're trying to solve those problems that you've got to solve. Um, time effectively slows down when you are somewhere small in 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 susan greenfield's language and that's particularly staring into the screen of a smartphone but in an office um uh, even you know if you're working from home remotely you've got if you've got all of these network uh, tools and technologies like email and slack and yammer constantly taking your attention you can't do proper deep work and you cannot get to the insights that you need to solve so get somewhere big is another really good hint and tip so, uh, so Sam, I would argue that <clears throat> one, understanding that you need this quietness in your life X times a week, X times a month is one, step one. Step two is understanding how to do the quietness, right? And so you mentioned when you have friends and, and colleagues and, and people in, in business that run or swim it, and indirectly and not, you know, intentionally solving problems, what if you could, right? You know, with, with when I do this, my intent is to quiet all noise and shut down all thought, shut down everything except for focusing on my breathing and letting my mind wander creatively and trying to, and as soon as something that comes up that's stressful, annoying, anxiety causing or problem related, I try to tune it out and I tune it out and then I just kind of let my brain float away but intentionally, right? And so that's my always my intent. And then you're right, subconsciously, solutions pop up. And then I, I might want to say, let me focus on that and dive into it, even though the therapist is working on a wicked knot on my hamstring, right? I mean, and so even, <laughs> even, even if I might think there might be pain there, I can literally detach from it enough where I'm like, I'm floating, I'm seeing colors, I'm seeing patterns, 
and then I see solutions. Have you, have you ever thought about like how you could deepen your, your way you can intentionally quiet instead of just saying, hey, let's just go to sleep. Let's just distract ourselves with a run or a swim. Instead of saying, hey, during this, I'm going to have an intent to quiet my mind. Without doubt. So uh, my wife, my son, uh, both practice mindfulness. Uh, I have done some of that. My sister-in-law is a, is a practicing um, Zen Buddhist. And uh, I am just amazed at one, the dedication, but two, at the, at the transformative impact that just thinking about, for example, uh, a koan, you know, what, uh, the, the, what, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Just thinking about that. Um, just the ability to, uh, to mindfully, to consciously um, acknowledge the disruptions of the day. Because, the, you know, uh, as, as you say, the more responsibilities we have, the older we get, the more dependence, be they uh, people that we're related to, people that we're employing, people who are employing us, the more uh, complex our lives become, the harder it is to, um, to, to, to find that time and space to do these things ourselves. And, and, I, and I, I mean, I, I have to say, I have turned, I mean, I'm a, I'm a slow, uh, I'm a slow runner who runs four times a week. And indeed, during the first, uh, I suppose it was a global, but UK national lockdown between March and June of last year of 2020, um, I did the, I, I live uh, at the edge of a little town uh, in, in, in rural Sussex in, in, in the UK. Um, and within two minutes, I get, I, 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 we're on the edge of the town, within two minutes, I can, I can get into the countryside. And there's a, there's a 6K run um, that I can do. And I, there are, I have two entry points to it, um, but there's a 6K run and exactly halfway around, there's a kind of kink at the corner of a field and you look down across the fields, across the Sussex Downs, down towards the sea. And I took, uh, and so 37 times, I'm not quite sure why it was 37, but it was, 37 times every two days, um, over a period of three months, I took a photograph at exactly the same point. Uh, and so I've got, sometimes it's snowing, sometimes it's uh, sunny, sometimes it's raining, sometimes it's so foggy you can't see across the field. It's exactly the same, exactly the same point. Um, and so two things there. One, that was like a kind of running meditation. So I was, I, I was going, I was doing exactly the same thing. It's partly, that was partly about trying to take some control back into life in a world that had fallen off its axis and doing something that was familiar and predictable um, and also out in the country and so away from, uh, away from you know, busting lots of other people. But it was, it was partly trying to take control, but it was also, it was running meditation for two reasons. One, because I've now got a huge poster um, uh, in, in the wall in one of my houses that a friend who's a photographer printed out, which is like a giant contact sheet of, of all the pictures that you did. Of all the pictures that I did, yeah, yeah, uh, and it's and, and it's and it's and it's it's you know it's not beautiful, but it's it's just a kind of a statement. But the other way that I've turned running into a meditation, and I do the same with swimming. So um, during the summer months in, in, in my town, Lewis in East Sussex. Uh, where Tom Paine, a great, a great American hero, Tom Paine, who wrote The Rights of Man, he wrote The Rights of Man about a mile and a half from where I'm sitting. Nobody in the UK knows Tom Paine, of course. They think he's a, he's a traitor because he fermented uh, the American Revolution and the French Revolution and so on. But anyway, um, uh, in, 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 so... But, it's but, funny because you know him as Tom, and I think we're taught that... You're Thomas Paine, right? <laughs> Thomas yeah, 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 yeah. You're, you're already buddies with him, huh? Got we it. are, well... Yeah, I, I think I think he's a great man. You know, the guy that invented universal suffrage and and uh, old age pensions and and, uh, and and labor rights and the rest of it. Anyway, anyway, but no, it's so, but so, but so in this town. Uh, um, but so when I when I run around the streets of this town, oh, uh, we have the oldest Lido uh, out, outdoor swimming pool in the country in this town. When I swim, uh, I count. I count. Uh, in, I count to 10 repeatedly, in a kind of meditative way, not to get into any kind of meditative trance or thing like that, but I count to 10. Um, in breaths are odd and out breaths are even. And then sometimes, you know, if I'm running, let's say, a, you know, a car will hair past and I'll know the person in the car and my mind will be distracted. But just as if you're in a city, seat, seated meditation or a lying meditation, whatever it might be, or indeed a massage med meditation as you're describing, um, uh, uh, I will just bring my consciousness back to, do you know what? 
actually I'm counting from one to 10 and it needs to be odd on the inverse. And so the actual act of running, I find to be, uh, or, uh, and swimming as well. I mean, swimming, I think sw swimming, there's something about swimming, the total immersion of your body in cold water. I think there is, some, my wife has actually started winter sea swimming. The, the sea temperature uh, in the UK uh, at the moment is about, or in the south of England, is about seven, eight degrees centigrade. Wow. Uh, and she's That's in. About, probably about 50 degrees. Yeah. Yeah, 50, 45, 50. Yeah. So um, I haven't followed her with that. Uh, but I do th this act of building a little bit of meditation into exercise, I think can make exercise more meditative than it otherwise would be. And since I've been doing that, which is about three years, I found exercise to be much more purposefully useful in solving insight problems. Yeah. So you're putting an intent besides just exercise to your exercise. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And, and exactly. so. That, you know, that, that, that's kind of step two uh, of what your theory is, is right. One is yeah. just to take the quiet time because you could do it on your couch or on your bed or on your floor, um, or you could do it wh while you're active with an exercise that's kind of, you know, kind of a solo sport, right? I could see myself doing this with rowing. Um, I've got bad hips. Uh -huh. so I don't like to run long distances, but I do play sports. And same reason I like to play sports. I usually play basketball and beach volleyball. Okay. But yeah, you, you can't think of anything else besides making that play, you know, making sure you're doing good for your team, getting that rebound or making that pass. So um, I get it. And then it quiets it down because then your brain needs that break. Because if you run a business, if you've got responsibilities, your brain is taxed constantly and it's got to be exhausting. I, I, absolutely. I mean, there, 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 are, there are two other, I mean, there are two other, there are two other ways that I think, so, I mean, people often say, well, it's all very well, you know, you talk about this, you know, you guys who run your own businesses, you get the chance to go running when you want to, or you get the chance to, to, to do what you want to do. But, you know, I've got a lot of clients, I'm working for something else. How do I factor time out in to enable me to have the, the, these eureka epiphanies? And I think, you know, I mean, you know, whatever type of business that you're working in, you can, you know, you're struggling to make a breakthrough on one client. Many people, most people are gonna be working on more than one client work on another client's business, do something for another client. So, so switch that, um, you know, do your expenses or your timesheets, um, do something really mundane. Um, I mean, uh, one of the things that I often say to people when they're, th when they're thinking about time out is there are three things that I love in life almost more than anything else. And when I tell them what they are, they say, are you the most boring person on the world? So I really like to do mundane things. So ironing, washing up uh, and mowing the lawn. Now, you know, we, most clothes you don't need to iron. I don't work in a smart industry. I work in a quite a casual industry, but I, you know, I don't iron underwear and socks, don't get me wrong, but I'm the only person in our, in our family who does the ironing. And I like it because there's a beginning, a middle and an end. So, so often, you know, say you're, say you're selling a property, you know, it can take months, right? Uh, say I'm helping a, a global pharma business develop a strategy for uh, insightful thinking in their business. It can take years. Um, uh, and there are points along the way that you do little celebratory points. Yeah, you know, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to certain point, you know, you've, you've got people looking around the house or you've, or you've got them to sign off on the first bit of it. So that's fine. But actually, it's very rare that there are kind of complete or finisher moments during a day. With ironing, there's a pile of ironing. And at the end of the day, there's a pile of iron clothes. Mowing the lawn. So we don't have a big, a big uh, backyard, but, but you know, it takes about 40 minutes to go up and down and up and down. And it's a beginning and middle end. Washing up. We have a, di a dishwasher. You know, we don't live in the dark ages, all of us over here in the UK. But yep. uh, there are certain things, there are certain times when just cr it's creating order out of chaos in a very mindless way. You know, you don't need to, once you've done mastered washing up and you don't drop plates, right? And you know how hard to scrub and you can learn these things quite early in life, you know, five and six year olds even can do these things. Um, but actually it allows, again, your mind to quieten from the hassles of the day and just to focus on that. Um, and I find those, those three things of ironing, mowing the lawn and washing up to be some of the most productive times of my day. Wow. Yeah. No, it's interesting. And, and, I, and I can't fault you at that because when I was younger, I went to private school and I did have to iron often. And I remember <laughs> to like it. I did grow to grow to like it. I was like, I didn't like having a crisp shirt as much as I just liked the process of taking the wrinkles out. Yeah. And then same with the lawn. I did my, fa my family's lawn every week and I put on some headphones and zone out and get it done in 45 minutes or whatever it was. Now I, I outsource those activities, but I still do the dishes all the time at my house and same type of thing. Like I'd rather do that than, you know, uh, take care of the kids laundry.
for example. But you know, it's 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 interesting that you mentioned that. So it, it's hard. I feel like I don't know if I get any insight out of those activities as much as I do when my mind is quiet. And but that's been the point, right? That your point is, hey, you create an insightful moment from taking timeouts. And then to, if you can schedule that into your life every week, every month, even more than once a week, uh, that could be beneficial to you. And, and critical thinking and uh, it is one of those tasks that you kind of have to program your mind to do it. Even if you're not actually thinking about something, you can passively critical think about something. Yeah, and I, I, I have, a, I have a, a very simple model for insightful thinking, you know, back to this Kahneman thing about swimming and cats um, uh, that, that, that I tr I've trained in for five plus years now. I've done hundreds of training courses in this. Um, uh, and it, it basically, it, it, it got four steps. One is be curious and be curious all the time, not just for the problem you're trying to crack, but be curious um, because when you are curious, you take in new stimulus. When you take in new stimulus, you never know how that's going to collide in your subconscious with something else. The second is to take time out. The third is to recognize what it feels like to have a breakthrough insight and to be able physically, physiologically. I describe it as scalp tightening. You know, when my favorite, when my favorite guitarist walks on stage and plays the, the, the first riff of my favorite um, tune, let's say it's because I'm such a dinosaur, Dave Gilmore, Pink Floyd, um, Doug, uh, wish you were here. Um, let's say it's that, for instance. I get a physical, my scalp, I can feel a twitch on my scalp. When I have a breakthrough insight, I physiologically get a twinge on my, on my scalp. Other people get butterflies in the stomach. Other people get a get blush. Um, I've spoken to so many people about what happens to them naturalistically. It's amazing the different things that happen. But recognize what that feels like. Be ready to capture it. And then the fourth one is, is about testing and proving and validating your idea. So don't cosset your ideas too, too, too much. Don't uh, over-articulate them. Don't... Um, polish them and burnish them and varnish them within an inch of their lives because you can then hold them up to your clients or your colleagues or your or, or your family uh, and say and they can say yeah that's really good but you everyone's thought of this already or why have you wasted your time doing this so you know be curious take time out recognize what it feels like and then uh, test road test them early that's not really a model but interestingly that um four-step structure of uh of having ideas of how ideas are had has occurred in the 20th century it occurred independently in many different fields it occurred in early psychology it occurred uh, in biology it occurred in mathematics it occurred in music theory and it occurred in advertising a guy called James Webb Young who worked at J Walter Thompson in Chicago can you believe this from 1912 to 1964 that was his in one company this guy he was a big advertising guy but he, did, he was a one company guy um he wrote this lovely little pamphlet called a technique for producing ideas in the early 40s in which you know he's one of these people and this simple four-step process when you expose people to it they say well is that really a model is that really and then you say well just try applying it to your life just try being curious listening to podcasts um, talking, you know, exactly like this one, listening to podcasts, talking to people, taking diverse opinion in, reading in different places, looking at the type of media you don't normally look at. So be curious, take stuff in, then force yourself to take time out, capture it and test it. They say, actually, that's incredibly helpful as a structure. Let me ask this, Sam, and we'll kind of wrap up with this last question. I've, I've started a practice the last few years of when I'm trying to brainstorm ideas. And, it, and it's never done in one day, right? We can't really solve big problems in one day, sure. but we can at least start the process and I'll list out and write down ideas and I'll push. And even if I'm brainstorming with my team or other people that I'm trying to solve this problem with, I'll push for all ideas and especially bad ones. I'll say, give me bad ideas, give me crappy ideas along with the good, because there could be aspects of the bad idea that might be relevant in what our final decision is to solve this problem. Have you ever have you ever done brainstorming like that? Love it, absolutely love it. So there is a there is a classic. It's from it dates from the mid fifties. Um, psychological test of elastic and free thinking, um, and elastic and free thinking is when you allow things to combine in ways like a child does, right? Like 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 the like a child does. 
but that is squashed out of most of us by by formal education. But that's 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 another debate. Um, so you know, how many uses in a minute can you think of of a paperclip, a brick, or a sneaker? Right. Um, uh, that's this. This is an exercise I run very, very, very often with people, and it's a classic test of of how. Um, people are willing to accept new ideas. I don't mean new ways of doing things necessarily, but how willing they're able to accept them, but also to come up with them. I think that is a brilliant way of doing it. It's very well established in psychology. There's a not far from you. Uh, how, where's Caltech? What city is Caltech in? Isn't that LA, Los Angeles? I think it, I think it is, isn't it? Yeah. So there, there's a brilliant there's a brilliant guy. He was the, he he was a physics prof there, a guy called Leonard Melodinoff, and he wrote a book called Elastic about elastic thinking. He, I mean, he's a great guy because he he's been a partner in a game software firm. He was a uh, he was a scriptwriter on Star Trek: Next Generation, and he's also a Caltech physicist. Um, but he he's brought together in this book Elastic. He's brought together a whole lot of different ways that you can. Um, have, as you say, even the rubbish ideas, allow your mind to be free to admit the possibility that this and this might go together. So, and you know, you never know, you might have the next iPhone, you might have the next Netflix, you know. Um, I think allowing in your brainstorming, even the worst ideas, uh, Edward de Bono, the thinker Edward de Bono often talks about, you know, different colored hats to have in creative thinking. And he has this rule about no black hats. And I know you're wearing a black hat, but you're not, not particularly, but, but, no, but metaphorically no black hats. And that no black hats is not people saying, oh, that would never work. Right. So in your brainstorming, just encouraging and collecting and writing on the flip chart all the ideas that people have and then just leave them. So this is, here's another point about time out. So I would encourage, you know, um, the, an ideal time for having insightful joining together useful ideas is towards the end of a working day. Not necessarily over a beer, it can be, that can help to free up. Sure. Indeed, Melodnoff talks about, talks about, you know, the liberalization of the cannabis laws being one of the greatest um, opportunities for insightful thinking. That's a completely other debate. Um, but, but towards the end of a day and to, and, and to have fun in doing it and not to punish people for having bad ideas because that'll never work around here. Writing them up on the flip chart, sticking them up on the walls and then just going out and leaving them. Yeah. Not, then, not trying to judge them at that point in time and coming back in the morning when you're fresh and alert and think, do you know what? Janice said this and Steve said that and, and Hennish said this. We can put these things together and we've got a great way of solving this problem. So I completely endorse that way of doing things. I think it's brilliant. Yeah, no, I, good, good. I appreciate the validation because I do it and I'm like, I think it's kind of fun, but you just didn't know, never know. If you don't really vet out a bad idea and see what the implications are, you, you might find some consequences that could be beneficial uh, and some consequences that aren't, but then you can kind of tweak those ideas. But you have to start with something to be able to massage it to something, right? You start with the block before you can turn clay into something more useful. Uh, and so that's why I kind of think of bad ideas as just like blocks of clay that you can kind of mold potentially into better ideas. Well, listen, if, I don't know if you're a sculptor, and I'm not sure you're a sculptor. I can tell you I'm definitely not. But my, you know, Michelangelo used to apparently be able to see what he was going to carve out of that block of, of marble. Um, uh, I won't right, say he chipped it away, right? Because he kind of did like a, a you know, subtractive type me method of yeah. picking away from yeah. one block and having something incredible at the end of it. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, I'm not a sculptor personally, but I know I have <laughs> that kind of vision when it comes to properties because we do construction here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A really, really very ugly house and imagine what it could look like with a new layout, with different materials, with different setup. Um, and I know that seems to be a fairly unique skill because I've taken people to houses with me and they can't imagine it isn't anything besides a crappy house that we're in right now. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so, you know, it's, it's a skill that comes with a little bit of practice too, right? It's because I've done this a long time sure. and that, that, that's helpful for anyone, right? No one's just good at anything just inherently. It takes some practice to get there. And I think that's, a, that's the same thing with insightfulness, coming up with ideas and doing timeouts. All of that takes practice. You can't just say, Hey, today I'm going to be good at taking a timeout so I can generate insightful ideas. That might take you a week or a month or a year or longer, and it's probably a lifelong learning thing to learn how to quiet your mind, generate good ideas, or not, or just quiet your mind and give yourself a break. Spot on. Absolutely spot on. Awesome. Sam, hey, thank you for spending so much time with me today um, and sharing your insight. You've got a book out as well, right? Can you? Can I do. You 
I do. I have a book that is modestly titled How to Be Insightful. Um, and all good online retailers uh, will offer how to be insightful. And, it, and, it, it, and it, it talks a lot about a lot of the issues that we've been talking about today. So you, so you can go from knowing, knowing nothing about how to be insightful, reading the book, and getting a good idea of how to start this process to carve out some time to become insightful in your own life. Absolutely, without doubt. And and one of the things that I think is important about book, and it's it's kind of a business book, but actually, you know, what we've been talking about um, is not just about business. This is about life. This is about this is about relationship with, with significant others, with family, with difficult difficult neighbours, with you know, with with uh, you know, how you're going to survive Thanksgiving next year, whatever it, whatever it may be. Um, I, I think this is a. I'm not saying it's a universal way of solving every single problem that you face. But, but, but if it's not just an analytical problem, which is how am I going to pay the bills this month, which is an analytical problem, um, if, it, if it's rather how am I going to grow my business such that I can be more of a, a passive owner than an active owner, that perennial one that we were talking about at the beginning, um, uh, uh, you know, these things don't necessarily come in, in, in blinding flashes. But I think this is something for, I, I think this is a model and a framework and a structure of thinking about thinking that is applicable to not just business problems. And to that end, I think that, that all, all, not self-help, but all kind of business books that enable you to do things need to be practical and buttoned down and give you um, a way of working things out. And I hope that people will find that my books are full of practical solutions and hints and tips from the Nappuccino to the getting somewhere big. Awesome. Sam, hey, thank you so much for joining me, taking some time out and sharing. Please check out Sam's book, How to Be Insightful. And uh, yeah, if you like and co- like the episode, please like, comment, subscribe, and uh, share the episode with some friends. But thank you, Sam, for joining me on another great episode of I've Got a Theory. Hopefully we get to catch up soon. Thanks so much.